Well, thank you all. I mean, I, I speak as the only soldier here, so I speak with some humility. And um, I realize that as I'm listening to you, I'm getting more informed, which is great. That's what I want. And I get more thoughtful, and then I get more anxious as I appreciate the, uh, the full depth of the uncertainties and the trade-offs the and the and the great changes you're talking about so you're talking about cultural changes and leadership change uh, leadership style changes and things like that so so, so ma magnitude of changes that i hadn't really appreciated from outside the service so um i think we need to start our questions with by setting some parameters of what the navy itself is doing so the navy is in a, a four structure review and um i've encountered this vicariously through the Marine Corps Force 2030, essentially a structural review. So, um, so far as you great, you know, you, you, you gentlemen can tell in the public domain, um, what do you predict as the significant changes to come out of the Navy's current? Well, um, speculating about the Navy's force structure review is, uh, popular parlor game now in Washington. Uh, although I, I think that some of it has been communicated. Uh, m most of it is, of course, classified. But the unclassified conversations and speculations and proposals that I've seen uh, seem to suggest a disaggregation, a dispersal, and a um, lightening or what's the word I'm trying to look for, a, a lessened capacity of individual units, along with uh, unmanned vehicles and so on. This seems to be motivated, and I'll, I'll let my, my friends and colleagues chime in here, seems to be motivated from the perspective of, if, we, if we're gonna take losses under these new, uh, really severe circumstances, at sea, um, let's lose less. I, I think there's got to be more to it than that, but I think it's it comes from the so far inability to solve the problem of defense at sea. Um, and th that's my sense of what's going on in that regard. Um, what's interesting about the Marine Corps side of the question is that the Marine Corps is moving out smartly. Uh, for right, rightly or wrongly, for better or for ill, and I think it's going to end up dragging the Navy with it. Uh, and the reason that's important is because if it doesn't, it can't do what it wants to do. Clearly, any Marine Corps concept of uh, expeditionary advanced base operations depends upon sea denial at least, but I would think preferably, much preferably, sea control so that they can operate without. Um, being uh, isolated and, and then wiped out, essentially, in very small garrisons. You, after all, you don't want to replicate, from the Marine Corps perspective, what the Japanese tried to do in World War II in their island garrisons. I mean, that's a horrifying prospect, right? And so anything that the Marine Corps has in mind is going to have to, it's, it's forcing the issue that's facing the Navy that the Navy may not want to embrace, which is how do we get forward and operate uh, uh, under the range arcs of Chinese long range fires? That's, that's my sense of those two things. Gary or Scott? Scott, you wanna throw in your two cents first? Well, my understanding is the force structure uh, review right now is being mostly driven by the Office of the Secretary of Defense, which reinforces the uh, issues that Paul touched on in terms of the Navy being able to figure out where to go. Uh, you know, so there's two questions really, what will it look like and what should it look like? And I think Paul hit on kind of what it should look like, which is very distributed, very offensive and in line with the Marine Corps concept. My guess is if the Navy had its way, what it would look like would be a, a small modification, but mostly more of the same. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, with Scott completely on that. I, uh, you know, Paul, the 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 the, the, the assessment, the structure, uh, the force structure assessment that the Navy did clearly did not meet Secretary of Defense Esper's expectations. 
Um, uh, one hand, you could argue that the Navy, uh, as has been reported in the news, the Navy you just doesn't want to change course or is incapable of changing course. That's one take on it. The other take is that the Secretary of Defense may not completely understand how a Navy should be built, how it, what to use it for, how to use it. Uh, the fact that SecDef said the, uh, the, uh, the deployment planning cycle process known as OFRP um, hasn't worked for 30 years. Well, actually it has. And the purpose of it wasn't to make things inexpensive. It was to be able to sustain a forward operating posture over decades in the face of continuing cuts in, in resources. And it worked extremely well, still works well. Uh, so I think uh, on, on the one hand, if, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sam Tangredi up at the Naval War College uh, put out a very good article recently on kind of looking at how, what the Navy's doing and how you know, the Secretary of Defense OSD has taken local manual control of the Navy's budget and assessment process. Uh, and then talking about you know, where perhaps OSD and that bureaucracy may not understand the role and uses of navies. What's unfortunate is the Navy hasn't necessarily been able to articulate that in its own defense. And that's part of why the, the, it, was, it was taken away. Um, I, the, the, what, I would, uh, what I would submit in addition, in, in, in kind of playing off what Paul said, uh, there's a lot of talk about dispersed forces and, and the need, based on what Scott said during his presentation about vulnerability and, and the ubiquitous nature of surveillance these days. The issue becomes, how do we, how do we know that's right? How do, we, how do we know we're placing our bets in the right direction? And you do that through wargaming, and, and there's a lot of challenges uh, in the wargaming and assessment world right now, uh, because basically everybody's using the tools that they, they have to hand. It's not necessarily using the tools that they would like to use. And so there's a huge, uh, I think, time lag in the technology of wargaming versus the demands that the new geostrategic environment is placing on the services to reinvent themselves. So I think that's a huge problem. For example, EABO, the uh, Expeditionary Advanced Space Operation concept that's in uh, Marine Corps Force 2030, uh, you know, says, we'll be great. We'll go on these islands and we'll, we'll go sink ships and we'll interdict and it'll be wonderful. Well, there's a lot of detail missing on how we're going to support that capability. So what's the logistics support line look like? Do we, we, I mean, we're used to doing a very, again, set piece logistic support infrastructure based on the assumption of a benign sanctuary at sea. Even in World War II, the Japanese largely gave us a buy on our logistics lines of communications. Uh, I do not think the Chinese will do that. And so how do we, how do we supply dispersed forces? How do we, how do we uh, rearm them? How do we you know, provide for fuel and whatever, you know, food, water, et cetera, et cetera, spare parts, replacement people? Um, that is really open right now because whatever we do from a logistics standpoint will have to be defended and escorted to a degree that we've never had to do before. And that puts a, a whole different demand on, on the Navy. Um, so. Uh, and then the last point I, I, I'll throw out here in terms of the force structure assessment is, is if you look at the Navy's 30-year shipbuilding plans over the last, I don't know, five, six, seven, ten years, they're, they're building legacy platforms. Okay, so we're building ever more Arleigh Burke class destroyers, uh, having commissioned and commanded one. I think they're magnificent ships, but, you know, they're a 1980s design at best. They're building the large surface combatant. It's going to, it may have kind of the aspects of Zumwalt, but it's going to be largely a legacy surface uh, for uh, surface ship. The, the FFGX, the future frigate, is an uh, Italian frame uh, based design. It's a conventional design. So we're, we're locking in essentially obsolescence over the next 30 to 50 years. And we have a great example in the ship that Scott commanded, the USS Zumwalt and her sister ships, that yes, they cost a lot per unit because it was, the R&D was done on a 
class that was going to be 23 ships, something like that. And then, and then we cut it down to three. So all that R and D cost had to be amortized across only three ships. Um, so there's, there's, and those are the ships that'll prevail and survive in the kind of environment that Scott articulated in his comments. And then all of that presumes that the only weapon system we're going to keep building are missiles. You know, there's very little emphasis, very little talk about railgun, uh, you know, lasers, you know, conventional EMP weapons. Uh, and things like that that could really shift shift the balance of of you know attack and defense in the Navy's favor. Uh, Bruce, may I add something to this, please? Please do, Paul. Please. Um, you know, one of the things that's coming out of uh, what's happening, but also the way we're thinking and the way uh, the, we're we've been expressing this is change. The change is upon us. There's no question about it. Um, it. It's a little hard, as I said, to judge the, the fleet um, plans that are being, the planning that's being conducted now. But my sense is that the current notions of change are just simply insufficient. That is to say, the concept the expanse, the, the notion of how much we're going to have to change, just as sort of a theoretical entering argument, it, it is just not there. And so how does one conceive of, how can one not only conceptually, but then practically come to grips with the extent of change that might be necessary? In other words, how do you uh, combine and recombine and, and dispense with ideas in your mind? It's very, very hard to do. And it's very hard to do with a pencil and a piece of paper. What Jerry has alluded to is the potential as yet unrealized because wargaming is so unwieldy that by the time you finish one, you forgot what, why you started it in the first place. It's, it's almost, almost literally, I, I know I'm being unfair, but we need, a, we need, techniques that are going to enable us to very rapidly try out new things and maybe perhaps more to the point to disprove either existing ideas and capabilities or emerging proposed capabilities. This, this cycle of change, this thinking first effectively, internal to the process uh, is important to the derivation of the strategy itself. It's important to the the, it, in the terms that Huntington was talking about, the organization that is the manning and training and equipping and the using and the application and the posture of navies and so on. This is more than, we're at a point where that's very similar, I find this fascinating, to the rejection of the Navy of its interwar, pre-World War II long-term planning preferences strategic preferences, which is you sail out, you have a big battle, and you come home for the parade. Very Mahanian. It was the concept of how this was going to work. Well, the Russians tried it with the Japanese, and it didn't work at all. And the U.S. Navy discovered in the interwar period, through wargaming, but uh, almost literally manual wargaming, that it wasn't going to work either. And they dispensed that whole notion. And built an entire new naval concept of bringing the logistics with the fleet. So it may be, you could make the case for them that the most important thing ever built in World War II was not the aircraft carrier, the battleship, or all the submarines and destroyers, it was a floating dry dock that they brought forward with them. You, you take the point that, that we're gonna do this out there and, and our progress is not gonna be impeded. It's very broad. I, I'm not arguing necessarily for that approach, although perhaps, but how do you come to grips with the fact that maybe there's something substantially fundamentally wrong with a 30-year shipbuilding program where the, the notion of having a ship for 30 years, perhaps, I'm just throwing this out, just simply doesn't make any sense anymore. Now, during real combat, the life expectancy of an airplane was in the double digits of flights. And so therefore, when we had a tremendous uh, industrial buildup, 
that was part of the the understanding. Um, tanks the same way. Soviet tanks coming out of the factory directly from the factory to the battle line, unpainted. What what do you mean? You not paint the tank? That's a very dis. I mean, think about it. It sounds simple, but it's very disruptive. So how do you come to grips with that in an organizational, not just personal, but an organizational integrated way? And I think Jerry has hit on it, and he and I talk a lot about this, so it's no surprise that I agree with him, that being able to conceive of all this stuff and balance all this stuff and play off these ideas against one another is going to require different techniques and capabilities for that as, as key precursors to what we do next. Well, thank you, Paul. I think um, the segue here is to compare the United States Navy's capabilities to China, because we're already talking about China as the focus of future threat scenarios, and the Marine Corps is certainly optimizing for a conflict with China in the uh, Asia Pacific region. So, um, can we assess? Um, the United States Navy's capabilities against China's Navy, uh, say, can we do it in a, on a 10 year horizon like the Marine Corps does to 2030, um, realizing that that's, uh, that, that sort of horizon essentially precludes consideration of what the United States Navy might procure on a 30 year horizon. So essentially we're assessing current capabilities or at least capabilities that might be online for launching within the next 10 years. Can we compare the United States Navy's capabilities with China? What are the, are there any missile gaps, for instance? Scott, do you want to lead sure. the discussion there? Sure, I'll jump on that. I think, um, so when the most effective weapon in naval war was the 16-inch gun, you needed something that looked like a battleship to carry it. Because you had to have a huge inventory of stuff. It had to have the stability and the strength to carry and employ a weapon like that. When the most effective naval weapon was the airplane, you had to have something that looked like an aircraft carrier. Um, now that we're into missiles, the, the most effective way to employ or to, to use naval power is now independent of the platform. I mean, let that sink in for a minute. So what I'm essentially saying is that Maersk has the biggest latent naval power on the planet. And the Russians are putting very effective weapons into things that look like shipping containers. Um, so the, the capability is now divorced from the platform and the US Navy's problem is we keep focusing on the platform. So to your question, could we quickly get back in this game I think the answer is absolutely if we focus on the weapons, the sensors, and a shift towards electronic warfare um, in terms of defense and to some degree offense uh, and backfit existing platforms rather than worrying about buying new ones. And then fundamentally rethink, as Paul suggested, what the future fleet that's optimized for a world where weapons and platforms are no longer necessarily um, that they don't determine each other's form. Uh, so yeah, I think a, you know, a five-year plan where we really focus on fielding an exceptional long-range anti-ship missile, um, much better passive sensors in particular, a lot of autonomous distributed stuff to support that and to clutter up the ubiquitous ISR picture. Um, and then electronic warfare is our primary defense, uh, puts the US Navy cheaply and quickly back in the game. Let me, uh, Bruce, jump in and, and, and follow up on Scott's comments. You asked this question really in terms of uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy capabilities today and over the next 10 years, and the US Navy capabilities, kind of a compare and contrast. Um, there is an area where, well, first of all, in my uh, sessions if with my PLAN counterparts, and Scott remembers this, um, there was a couple of things that jumped out, and you watch uh, the Chinese military modernization, and especially their naval modernization. Um, you know, they've gotten lighter and smaller 
uh, they got rid of 300,000 People's Liberation Army personnel. They have absolutely gone all in on uh, missiles, as Scott pointed out. Uh, they're into hypersonics. They have every flavor of ballistic missile that you can imagine, and they have two things going on there. They're modernizing in capability, but they're also uh, recognizing that numbers matter. Their capacity, the capacity they're building, and you look at their shipbuilding program, their submarine force, across the board, they figured out that numbers matter, niche capabilities are okay. Um, interestingly enough, uh, they continue to use the US Navy as their stalking horse. When I talked to the PLAN admirals, one of them, Admiral Shen, now their chief of Navy, uh, there's one other thing that jumps out that they want that we have, and it's on the personnel side. It's the professional NCO Corps that the US Navy has, that the US military has. They still have, you know, largely a conscription mentality in those lower ranks, and they want that mid-level uh, technical warrior that the U.S. has, especially uh, in the U.S. Navy. And so I find that interesting. I also find it interesting, and, and um, you know, I'm kind of mixed on this one, as they build aircraft carriers. You know, I'm, I'm one of those that remember I, came, I grew up in the submarine force. And to a submariner, you know, there's, there's two ships in the world. There's a submarine and then there's a target. Well, um, they're now heading down the road of aircraft carriers. Uh, these are iconic platforms. Much like an SSBN, this ship submersible ballistic nuclear strategic platform, they're incredibly expensive. So I'm almost over on the sidelines applauding uh, that they're heading down the road of building aircraft carriers. Have a ball, okay? I think that, that Jerry and Paul and Scott have it exactly right that in pretty short order, it needs to look like um, less expensive, distributed, electronically masked, or uh, use of deception for defense. And as Wayne Hughes would say, it is absolutely the age of missiles at sea. If it's moving and you can put a missile on it at range, which then begets this targeting issue, uh, you're gonna compete very, very well in naval engagements. We have that opportunity. Jerry, Paul, and Scott have kind of laid out that uh, move forward, but it's absolutely gonna go back and, and, and I'll kind of leverage off something Paul said, and I think Scott would definitely agree with me, since he's kind of been my resident wargaming expert since he was at Halsey Alpha as Lieutenant Commander. How do you create, I, I think more importantly than all the eaches of the platforms and the, and the weapon systems, how do you get after this wargaming system that gets you to best of red and best of blue very, very rapidly. You watch it over in the video gaming world, how quickly online these gamers will get to a best of red, best of blue uh, way of doing business. And, and Scott Tate had to teach me this, all right? But that's absolutely critical to this five to 10 year window of being able to um, go toe to toe with the PLAN. Now, the likelihood of getting into a major confrontation with the PLAN and, and absolutely um, imposing costs on them over the next five to 10 years, um, back to Paul's original point and Jerry's, I'm not sure we have the political will to do that. Oh, thank you, Robert. I mean, I think the the next question that comes up is um, you know, how far should the United States Navy concentrate on cyber warfare and and or electronic warfare? 
uh, because I mean, you can you can look at some U.S. allies who are talking the talk that they're going to optimize for cyber warfare. So Britain is one example. There's been some leaks that Britain is thinking about cutting its ground forces by up to 20 percent. Uh, so that it can afford to optimize for cyber warfare, for instance. The Australians have just announced that they're going to spend more and most of that spending is going to go on cyber warfare. So um, what's the United States Navy's need requirement for cyber warfare capabilities or, uh, and, and, and also for the electronic warfare capabilities that Scott's already um, introduced us to? Uh, I, Scott will be the right guy to talk about this in detail. I, I just want to offer up front that uh, if you look at the Chinese concept of informationized warfare, uh, it, 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 it incorporates our information warfare, cyber warfare, EW, all into one uh, missionary, if you will. And where I think we tend to, <clears throat> we tend to have it, you know, cyber and IW and EW as, as co-equals with air defense and anti-surface, anti-subsurface warfare and strike warfare. I think the Chinese approach is the big, the big ball, the big sphere is informationized warfare into which all these other ones fit as sub subordinates uh, within that larger sphere, larger ball. And that is is how they're approaching things and it, it's i think very different than the way we do it so for them you know the the primary first part is getting that big ball right from you know in the gray zone from pre-conflict on up and then everything else fits into that so uh, you know partly what i think the u.s navy and dod uh, need to do is is look at how the chinese are approaching this and say, okay, you know, we can actually learn from our adversaries. How do we, how do we reshape our own uh, military approach, doctrine, culture, strategy to fit into that kind of world? So that's my offering on that. Yeah, Scott, uh, would you? Before Scott. Uh, yeah, please. Before Scott starts, because um, I want to hear what he has to say for sure. Um, this is part of the conundrum of technological process that you get too enamored of. So we've spent how many years now, how many decades building up networked forces with the idea that you can, you can now see everything and, and anything you can see you can hit and therefore you can hit everything, right? That's the whole point behind what we've done. The trouble is we've built that system of systems, which who wouldn't want that, right? With this terrible, terrible vulnerability. So the first thing that we have to come to grips with about cyber is if we want to, and if we must depend upon those uh, systems, uh, interconnections that make this whole enterprise work, we've got to protect it against cyber. And then if you just ex ex extrapolate from that thought, then of course you want to attack the other guy's systems because he's going to be more or less networked in the same way. But what Jerry really adds to the conversation because this whole notion of information warfare, which kind of combines all of these things, in the Chinese, from the Chinese perspective, is pretty, I think I want to use the word dreadful. Uh, because they, they apparently think, they the Chinese, that they can get to the point where they can predict what we're going to do before we do it. Uh, and, and that's not from watching us closely, okay, he's, he just started to go left, let's intercept him. That's not what I mean. No, they, they're, they're ahead of before we even make those decisions. So this whole notion of information warfare, operational intelligence, um, as it's wrapped up, cyber is uh, an important part of it because it gets at the foundations of how all of those systems work, but it's only part of it. And my sense is that 
that it's just not even close to being accepted as the priority that it has to be. So this is a real challenge. Yeah, so it's, it's a, I mean, obviously a huge, huge target to shoot at here, right? It, it's a big topic. It's incredibly complex. Um, at the strategic level, I think we're about where we were in the 1950s with our understanding of nuclear weapons. So now that economies and electric grids, you know, it's now that cyber weapons can have, at least we believe they can have widespread physical effects that would have strategic consequences at the strategic level, we need the same sort of academic rigor that we had in the dawn of the nuclear age about what deterrence theory means and what war on that scale means and what, you know, it, it's just something we haven't taken seriously as a society. Um, at the operational and tactical level, I think we're about where we were in maybe the second or third decade of the airplane becoming a, a military weapon. You know, we in initially thought that one squadron could sink multiple aircraft carriers or ships, and that didn't turn out to be true. One squadron could maybe at best sink one aircraft carrier or ship on a, on a sortie. Um, I think at, you know, operational and tactically, unless we are phenomenally stupid, and there is some evidence that we are phenomenally stupid in this regard of putting ever, all our eggs into the cyber basket. Uh, yeah, there will be degradations, but not complete denial. You know, humans have proven incredibly clever in the face of blockades and other things to find substitutions and other ways to do stuff that they need to do. Um, it'll take time and it'll be very disruptive, but I think it'll be disruption, not complete denial. Um, now, as we make choices going forward on the military side in particular, I would say, I would argue that everything we build should be cyber and network enabled, maybe to gain efficiencies and, and for when we can use it, but none of them should be cyber or you know, not, none of the critical systems should be cyber dependent or network dependent, and, which is to say they can't be used in a highly contested cyber network environment. You know, things should have manual backups. They should have the onboard processing capability to make their own decisions and function without having to talk to other things. Bruce, let me just uh, punctuate uh, what Jerry, Paul, and Scott said. And it, it's a, a question that I've been uh, grappling with uh, really since you suggested this idea of, hey, what does the U.S. Navy and warfighting look like in 2030? Um, and I'll use the example of the F-35, the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, the aviation part of our military industrial complex talks in terms of fifth generation aircraft. And that the Joint Strike Fighter is this information node and you're really, um, the advantage of course is this information dominance uh, in the air space, the air battle space. So I think the Marine Corps starts to get after that a little bit in Force 2030 with, okay, so what does the fifth generation ground force look like? And this discussion that we've been having now for, you know, over an hour and a half is what does the fifth generation fleet look like? In particular, the distributed, networked, smaller, maybe even looking somewhat commercial, uh, logistically supported fifth generation fleet look like. And um, I, I think that that's the real value uh, of this discussion that you've prompted is um, how does this uh, electronic maneuver warfare this networked and distributed lethality idea. Uh, and back to, to Paul's point, uh, you know, does it start to look a lot like uh, 15,000 ton motor vessels that are rented and, um, you know, you have a small crew, uh, largely automated ship, but weapons and electronics that, you know, previously had only been resident in a Arleigh Burke class destroyer or a Zumwalt like ship. Um, still that question and unless we're willing to 
make that bet and really change what we're doing, um, in 2030, we're going to look a lot like we do today. 